welcome home. We're talking about the world and the great what's going on and Passover and the Israelites and the wilderness and how we can move forward in a beautiful way. So we're talking about being a crew. I learned it sailing with my brother Yoni and a crew of holy sailing Jewish pirate hooligans on the Caribbean. And um, we would take turns being captain. Like there was a, a captain, but we would take turns like leading and sometimes literally steering the ship. And when you're steering the ship, you're like the captain of the moment and you get to call things out. Well, we live in a world today where everybody's actually taking turns captaining, you know? When I go over to uh, a friend's house to help them with their garden, like they're the captain of that project. When I go to your house for a, a festive dinner, you're the captain of the table. When I go to your, if, I'm at, if we're sharing a table for Passover a ceremony and you're running the ceremony, you're the captain. When you teach me something, you're my rabbi, you're my teacher. Okay, so we live in a world today where there's not one captain, where we take turns leading things. Ah, leading. Everybody wants to be a leader. <laughs> right? It's like the American dream is to lead, 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 lead. What about being a crew? I want to talk about being on a crew because that's what most of us are most of the time. We're on a crew. You know, for the big captain, for the little captains, we're on a crew. And there's an art to it. And um, I was sailing last year when this thought came to me. Now the Israelites, when they were wandering in the desert, were a terrible crew. I hope I'm not speaking Lashon Hara, speaking negatively about someone, but it just says it in there. Like they were naughty and they were not super helpful a lot of the times. They, and there were several times where they literally had picked up stones and were about to throw them at their captain who had rescued them from a terrible, terrible dark scene in Egypt. And they were just, they were, they were hard. They were stiff necked. They were like, and I'm not, I'm not, I hope I'm not speaking bad, you know, if their souls are listening right now, but like they weren't super cooperative. Okay. So what I want us to think about is how we can be the awesomest crew members. I actually, more than that, I want to live in a world where we're all being awesome crew for one another. And so I came up with a little a little saying, and I wanna say this up front, so like if something sticks with you, maybe this will stick with you, is when you're being crew for somebody, whether it's at their birthday party, whether you're at their table for Sabbath, whether you're helping them with the garden, whether you're like literally their crew on a boat or on a motor home, when, when somebody else is leading, here's a nice little thing to think about. Be the crew, be the type of crew that you would wish you had if you were captaining in that situation. Be the type of crew that you'd wish you would have if you were leading a Seder, if you were leading a project, if you were throwing a birthday party, if you were trying to do something important in the world. Imagine you were trying to do something important in the world. How would you like your, your crew to show up to help? Okay, you would want them to think ahead. How could I be helpful? I wonder what the captain, the person who's captaining right now, how I could best, you know, show up. Maybe that means being quiet. Ooh, maybe that means whispering something that you see and that you notice, but just whispering it to the captain, not in front of everybody because you don't want to make a big tumult. Okay, if you were the captain, maybe you'd, and somebody saw something, you'd wish that they just whispered it in your ear and didn't announce it, right? So as a fixing of the Israelite, now the Israelites, because of their challenges with being cooperative and helpful and being a crew, they wandered and wandered and wandered and wandered for 40 years until that generation actually died off in the wilderness, all except for two. So part of part of what being part of the spiritual world today, what we're doing is we're actually fixing what was left over and broken from biblical times, which we're still in biblical times, but from like the Torah and stuff. So when we can be awesome crew for one another, and when I can like think ahead of what my friend, what my brother or sister needs when they're leading something, it's actually fixing the brokenness of the world and it's fixing the Israelites 
Brewers lost for such a long time. Can you dig it? That's what we got to physically get rid of. Everybody knows, though, that the physical world and the spiritual world are infused, right? I mean, there's a million stories in all of our lives that speak to this. And there's a million and, and one stories in the Torah, in the Tanakh that speaks to them. I'll share one. So I'm a sailor. So I'm, I'm, I'm really into like the, the, the Jonah, the Jonah, the story of Jonah and the whale, you know? He's on a boat with inner chumets, right? He has a life purpose to go to the town of Nineveh and to go help the people heal themselves. That's his, that's actually what his soul came to the world to do. And he's trying to deny his purpose and the weather changes because of it. And they were all spiritually wise enough to know that if the weather is being so violent, if there's dark forces, if my world is uncharacteristically nasty, it's probably connected to some inner dimension. Most, a lot of people today don't, even, don't live with that awareness. But, but it's true. And, and anybody who's mildly hip knows to look there. Another, another quick, you know, right? And then, and, then, and then Jonah jumps overboard and the, the waves stop. The Baal Shem Tov of blessed memory at one point had to, was on a boat also and had to throw his manuscripts overboard. On the seventh day of Pesach, we, it's customary in some circles to read the story of when Baal Shem Tov was on a boat. There's a crazy story. It's like a half hour long awesome story that involves cannibals and sailboats and wagons and a third reference to the spirit world and the physical world is we just had the Purim story and in that story I'm not going to go into it too much but the king of that story Achashverosh can't sleep at night he's so bothered and he even was wise enough to know oh I can't sleep I'm so bothered there must be something in the spirit world. I, I, I forgot to give credit to somebody. I forgot to reward someone. And therefore, my inner world is off. See, the physical world and the spiritual world, they, they're, we, anybody who's mildly awake knows that like, what you're walking with in your heart is going to affect your outcomes one way or another. It's not, like, it's not such a science. It's not like one plus one equals two. But what we're carrying, how we're attuned on our insides, affects our physical world. The, these five types of, of wheat, barley, rye, uh, oats, and spelt mixed with water and yeast for more than 18 minutes, it starts to poof up. Okay, it gets inflated. It gets distorted. And that is the characteristic that I most resonate with, with, with what chametz is, the stuff that we're ridding of our, ourselves of, is the hype, the inflation, the distortion, the pretending, uh, the, the putting on a face, right? And, and Purim is also about laughing at the faces we wear, laughing at the faces and the masks that we wear. Pesach is about the true face because that's, that's freedom. The freedom is when I can... My soul can be what it is, and I don't have to, I'm not getting distorted, I'm not getting inflated, I'm not getting hindered, I'm not getting blocked by, by my parents, by my relatives, by my spouse, by, like, by my friends. Oftentimes, our best friends actually are... And, I'm, and everyone should have lots of friends and best friends and love your best friends. But oftentimes it's our best, closest friends who actually can hold us into old, into old versions of ourselves. And I'm never saying, I'm not saying at all, God forbid, God forbid, I'm not saying to ever ditch your friends, you know. But what I am saying is like, grow yourself and a good friend will encourage you. A, a non-healthy friend will try to trap you in an old version, an old version of yourself, okay? A good friend will grow with you. A good spouse, uh, from what I've heard, a good spouse is going to have to allow you to change and grow at some point because that's a human healthy thing to do. And like, 
that sometimes is the difference between a successful relationship and a not successful relationship is like, does my spouse let me grow? Or are they trying to hold me into old versions of myself? I want to give a very practical pointer for how to invite community and friends and family who support your transformation and growth. If you want to surround yourself with friends and family who support your transformation and growth, here's the number one technique. B. A family member and a friend who supports other people's transformation and growth. Watch what happens. Watch what ha happens when you start being people's biggest cheerleader. When you see a friend who's changed and instead of giving them the stink eye, you start celebrating their growth and their change. Be people's biggest transformational cheerleader, you know, and, and see how the universe will just send you people to turn you on on your transformation and growth. Okay, so chometz is what keeps us from being free is sometimes a very small thing. Chometz is, chometz can be the smallest crumb. There's no minimum, I'm ad-libbing here, but there's no minimum measurement. With most things in kashrut, there's a minimum requirement. But in, with chumetz, even if it's called a mashahu, it means if it has any existence, it's considered chumetz, no matter how small it is. One crumb, sometimes one crumb. He says, one crumb could destroy your life. One crumb of chumetz. Of course, he's not just talking about inflated bread. He's talking about our distortions of things. He says, listen to this, listen how deep this is. He says, you know, friends, I could swear that most couples get divorced. When they do, there's no major event. Sometimes there is, but usually it's not a major event. It's crumbs. You know, people holding on to crumbs. And he says that on Pesach, we get rid of all the crumbs. He says that redemption is but a little thing. It's, it's like a mashahu, like that measurement of just somethingness. Between, between redemption and being a slave, between being a good parent, a good husband, a good spouse, a good mother, is sometimes a very little subtle thing, something so tiny. You know, in, in the Jewish wisdom tradition, there is a way of declaring that objects are no longer in your possession, even if they're actually in your possession. There's a spell. We actually say it. We're going to say it about the chametz. We say any chametz that is accidentally left over in my home, I declare it's not in my reshut. It's not in my domain anymore. But I want to speak to possession and ownership for a moment. Listen to this. This is, this is amazing. And it comes from Rabbi Nachman, great Rabbi Nachman teaching about ownership. And he says like this. I'll tell you a little story first. Imagine you're walking down the beach. You're walking down uh, uh, Miami Beach. Or where's a pretty beach? You're walking down the Florida Keys. Ba Bahia Honda. Isn't that a Bahia Honda? Yeah, place? Bahia Honda. You're walking on the beautiful Bahia Honda where I, I camped there once. I had an amazing time. You're walking down a beautiful beach. And let's say you've never been on this beach before. And you look down and you see a rock, which is, we're going to call my, my guitar pick a rock. And you've never seen this rock before. Turns out the rock has been sitting on Bahia Honda Beach for 10 million years, or 10 trillion, shmillion, megillion years, since, or, or 6,000 years, however you count time. But since the beginning, when rocks were created, this rock has just been sitting there, perpetually picking its nose, doing its own thing since the beginning of creation, however long ago you think that was. Okay? You've never met it before. It's never met you before. And Sarah walks over to this rock, notices it, and does a magic trick. Watch the magic trick. She goes like this. She puts her hand over it and then closes her hand on the rock. Takes the rock and puts it in her pocket. Magic. Now something magical actually sort of just happened because what if she then goes home with that rock in her pocket and puts it on her desk, 
if if she invited Jen over for lunch, if Jen got for some or not Jen, if somebody, if if, if Joe Schmo came over and took that rock, it's as if they stole from you, Sarah. But like, it's your rock. The rock has been around for since the beginning of time. You just met it two days ago, and all you did is wave your hand on it, close, put it in your, and then put, and now it's yours. Yeah. Yeah, it is. There's actually something to it, says Rabbi Nachman. Yes, when you possess an object, whether it's from the, from the Rashut Harabim, from like the public sector, from the free sector, from like, you know, like a rock on the beach, which is sort of open to everybody, whether you're acquiring it, the word is kinyan. It's actually a very magical word to purchase, to acquire, kinyan. When you acquire objects, says Rebbe Nachman, you put your soul print into those objects. All of your t-shirts, all of your cups, all that chazarai in your drawers, I hate the, the garage, all that stuff, you actually have, uh, if we had eyes that could see the spirit world clearer, you know, if Aaron's energy field was turquoise and we could actually see see clearer we would see shades of turquoise glimmering in all of his books and everything that has his Aaron ownership on them there's actually a bit of him in it and if you steal that's why when stealing objects is such a big deal and he goes on further to say and that's why it's really important not to like put your soul print in something junky, <laughs> to, to put it nicely. Like, he would tell you don't, like, don't have too many things. Like, let the things that you own and that you put, that you acquire, that you do kinyan on, that you put your soul print on, like, let it be special, beautiful objects that are precious, not just junky. And sometimes we hold on to things that are no longer ours. And it, it, it actually can keep our energy stuck and cloistered. And as many of you know, probably just as well as me, if not better, that sometimes one of the greatest things you can do in your life to free up bandwidth and space to get to the next phase of your life sometimes is letting something go, right? So especially something that was important sometimes. Now, some, there's going to be things in your life that you want to never let go of. You're never going to let go of your son, right? Like that's, that's forever. You have some, some, the most important things, the best things. You find your life partner, you hold on to him for forever. Like, but, but, but sometimes, you know, you, if, letting go of a certain job, for example, can open up your bandwidth for something magnificent that you could not have received if you were still holding on to that, right? And I, I, can't, um, I can't tell you what to release and what to hold on to. It's a very personal thing. Yes, a lot of what the plagues were about was, uh, how do I say this nicely? Like, reminding, you know, Pharaoh thought he was God and he thought that he had jurisdiction that he didn't. And he thought that he had powers that he didn't. And actually each one of the plagues was specifically designed to remind him who was really the creator of the world. You think you control the sun? Yeah? Yeah? It's, you know, it's the sun god. You're the sun god. Well, guess what? Like, darkness. You're going to have darkness for three days, okay? Like, each one of the plagues was to remind Pharaoh of the truth. And so, yeah, having to relinquish this ownership was, was partially that, yeah. So I just wanted to give a shout out to, like, the cleaning and letting go of what's not yours anymore. And it's such a spiritual practice. And some people go their whole lives without ever once going through a complete cheshbon nefesh, a reevaluation from top to bottom, from the attic to the basement of like, who am I? What am I here for? Now, let me tell you something else. And we're going to get, when you have an old way of being that's toxic, let's say, like, let's say it's an addiction or an unhealthy relationship and you go to evaluate it, they're tricky. They're like little demons. And they're tricky buggers. If you have an old bad habit, it's like a leech. They're like leeches. And, and this is actually in the Jewish, the Jewish mythology of dark forces. 
call dark forces like leeches. They leech onto your life force and they suckle. And they, they're very tricky. I know you've all been through like life a lot and you've worked through, you know, habits and patterns that weren't healthy. And you know that inner voice will sometimes tell you like, you can eat, you can eat that junk food. Like you don't need to exercise. There's, you're not, you're, you keep doing this. You can keep drinking. I don't know what, you know, another cigarette won't hurt you. It's just a cigarette. Like, you know, like our bad habits have a way of talking to us and tricking us into keeping them around. Right. You agree, right? Yes. So listen to this. When you start doing your inner badika, your inner searching, for your inner chumets, for the things that are inflated and distorted. And that's a little, we're starting to get into what chumets is. When you start looking for the things that aren't yours anymore, the things that aren't serving the most high, your highest purpose, your freedom, your freedom story. When you go and look at something inside of you, when you go to evaluate a uh, inner quality that's actually toxic, you know what it's going to say to you, to the searcher? The inner qualities is a, don't look here. You don't need to evaluate me. Like, you need me. That's usually what the voice of a dark force that's latching onto you will say. It'll tell you any, whatever it can tell you. It wants to stay around. It wants to live off of you. So it'll say, oh, no, you don't need to look here. You looked here five years ago. You tried to get rid of me five years ago. Remember we agreed that you needed me around? We're, we're cool. No, no, officer, I'm fine. Thanks. Like. No, I'm, I don't need your help. Like, that's exactly what a tricky, uh, unhealthy pattern or habit will tell you. So here's, you have to out-trick them. You have to be trickier than them. And so here's one little tip, is if you're ever doing your inner evaluation, your inner cheshbo nefesh, and you ever hear an inner voice that says, no, you don't have to evaluate this. Bring a, bring a, bring a floodlight. <laughs> like, okay, wait, just wait, hold on there one second. Yeah, okay, yeah, I won't, yeah, I'll just stay there one second, I gotta get something. Come with like your biggest, bring 10 flashlights, a candle, and all your friends to all put a light on it and then look at it, okay? Because it's probably hiding, it's probably got some contraband, something naughty's going on. Because if you have a healthy life enhancing quality and you say, hey, can I see what's in your backpack? Sure. Look, I got a book. I got a Rebbe Nachman book. I got um, a Hafiz poetry book. Like, I got a, a, a letter, a love letter that I'm writing to my parents. And I've got some organic spelt bread and homemade hummus. Like, come, you can look. You want some? That's, that's the voice of a healthy inner quality. Does not mind being evaluated. Okay? We can still evaluate a healthy life-enhancing quality. You look at it. Does this help? Yeah, put it back, put it right back in. I'll put it back in my bag. I'll keep it. 